I want to discuss with you the topic of leadership. The topic of leadership when it concerns the prevention of injuries, but also when it concerns the care of injuries. I believe that leadership is a uh, topic of interest when we want to improve our, our game in terms of prevention and care of injuries. And I hope that through this lecture, I can guide you through this and that you understand the limits of evidence implementation when we do not consider the injury context, the athletic context. I would like you to reflect on your own role in the ecological model around an athlete. And I will present with you a, a management model that I believe we can use to organize rehabilitation and prevention plans for athlete care. And in doing so, first I will um, describe a brief history. Where does this idea come from and why, do, why is it needed? I will go into the limits of implementation. I will discuss why I believe that leadership is a next level in what we can do. And I will describe that as a process. I will try to explain what it takes to be a good leader, although there's no good definition of that. Um, and then I have an example that shows that it can actually work. So let's start with this brief history. Uh, when we talk about sports medicine in, in current times, we do not think back of the ancient Greeks. Probably, arguably, where it started was 1992 when Willem van Mechelen presented his sequence of prevention. A four-step model that describes the process from problem through etiology, injury development, injury prevention development, towards uh, evaluation. And over time, this model has been used and used and used. But we've learned already that simply having evidence that prevents injuries doesn't really prevent injuries. So that's why in 2006, at the first uh, injury prevention conference in Oslo, Caroline Finch proposed two additional steps to the sequence of prevention, the TRIP model. And she basically said, it's good to have evidence, but if athletes do not use it, we will not prevent any injuries. So we need additional steps. We need to implement our evidence, our preventive evidence, into an athletic context to make the athletes use it. Now, one issue here is that the implementation process based on the TRIP model is based on evidence that is guarded through steps one through four, which we usually call efficacy type of evidence, evidence that has been guarded in a laboratory controlled setting. Now we need to move that towards the population. The population is not a controlled setting. But in our implementation approaches, we believe or we take the approach that we can intervene one on one. So what we find in the laboratory, we can also find in the population. But over and over, we find that that is not the case. It doesn't translate one on one. Here's an example. So if under current conditions, let's say we have a hypothetical intervention that prevents 60% of all injuries as shown in our beautiful randomized controlled trial. Now, if we only reach 10% of our population and only 25% of that population we reach actually uses our intervention, our community effectiveness is dwindled down to one and a half percent. So in our trial, we see in our group a 60% reduction of injury risk, but in the community, we only see one and a half percent. And this is a simple 60% times 10% times 25% equation. So of our 60%, we only reach two and a half percent of effect in the population. Now, if we write a beautiful implementation plan, and we listen to our athletes, we listen to our coaches, we take all their barriers and facilitators into account, and we write this beautiful program to bring our evidence to practice. Probably we will reach more. Well, we can reach 50% of our intended population. Probably they adhere better because we have beautiful videos, uh, we have beautiful leaflets, we have instructions and education, so people understand the need of it. But still, our community effectiveness is only 10%. And in the end, we only have 15% left of our beautiful efficacious evidence. Now, how can we do better? Yes, I think we can. I think we can. But first, I need to explain where does this come from? Well, from implementation sciences, we know really well um, 
that the effect of what we find in efficacy trials doesn't really translate to effectiveness trials. Well, the moment you move from your laboratory into the wild, there's disturbing factors there that we can't control and that have a negative effect on our expected outcome. If we do an implementation trial, that's even further dwindled down because in an imp implementation trial, we have even more disturbing factors out of our control. Well, we have reality. This is simply what happens. And we call this the so-called voltage drop in implementation terms. Now, once implemented, over time, you hope that what you found will actually remain if you follow that up over time. Well, you already guess that that's not the case. Even then, over time, you know, the expected effects after implementation drop further down. We call that program drift. And that's simply due to external factors and measures. Um, the program is used differently, is used less, and the effectiveness further goes down. Uh, we put some real numbers in here. These are some real numbers from, from uh, our ankle prevention programs, uh, recurrent ankle sprain prevention programs. We see in our randomized control trials a 60% reduction in recurrence injury risk. Now implemented, we see a 40% reduction because it's less used. And now over time, after a few years, we measured again and we only see 25% reduction left. Still, I think, pretty good uh, compared to, to, to other, other numbers we sometimes see. But you can see how much of an effect is lost here. By my idea here is that we focus too much on the theory. We focus too much on the efficacy evidence. We focus too much on that 60%. We have this program, our ankle program, 12 weeks, three times a week, 20 minutes of exercise sessions. That's what we want people to do. And if they don't do it, they're not adhering to our intervention. But what if we take a little bit off of that efficacy? What if, what if we dwindle our theory a little bit down? What if we don't say 12 weeks, three times a week, 20 minutes? But what if we say, okay, it's okay if you do eight weeks, or it's okay if you do the 12 weeks, but maybe you do 10 minutes of exercises? Probably we can't expect the same effect, slightly. But because the intervention becomes easier for people to, to do, a message becomes easier to, to, to communicate, probably our coverage goes up, probably our athlete adherence goes up because the intervention fits better the athletic context or the athlete's context. And here you can see that the community effectiveness is actually 25%, which is, in this case, 63% of what we could expect to achieve. And that's a much, much better outcome in the end. The thing here is that evidence alone is not sufficient. Um, and usually we base our implementation practices or our implementation goals based on what we know from research, our evidence from research. And we fail to combine that with evidence on practice. So not only why and what to do, but also how to do it. We don't listen enough to practice. And then we need to understand also the context. Who needs to do it, where they need to do it, and when do they need to do it. And these three need to be combined if we talk about proper implementation. This kind of fits more of an eco ecological approach, a more holistic approach. And this was also proposed by Bolling, um, who said that if we look at injuries the way we're doing right now, we have a pretty simplistic view. We look at the injury, we look at the joint, and we try to understand what's happening at the joint, what's happening at the occurrence of that injury, and we build our preventive measures around that. And in doing so, we forget that there's an athlete attached to that joint or that muscle or that tendon. We forget that that athlete is part of a specific sport and that sport is, is governed by a specific association nationally or internationally. And maybe there's also some geographical spread in terms of structure of care, popularity of sport and, and, and whatsoever. And at all these levels, there are certain factors that act upon the injury and that we should consider when we, when we talk about injury prevention and talk about uh, care, of, care of injury. Now, this paper was published in 2018, and in the same year, from implementation sciences, also a new guideline came out. And this guideline also took a more ecological approach. And basically, what this guideline says, uh, acknowledged that there was a difference between research and practical context, and that that can be addressed 
not after intervention development, but it needs to be addressed during intervention development. So not after step four in the TRIP model, but at step three in the TRIP model, at the moment we develop an intervention. Right? And we need to focus on the system. We need to focus on the personnel who deliver it. We need to focus on the characteristics of the intervention. Basically, they say we need to take context into account. And if we look at what we're doing in implementation right now, we only focus on certain aspects of this more holistic ecological implementation approach. So we're missing a lot of bang for a buck here. We can do much better. And this is a, a quote from the New York Times and that stated that the pursuit of simple solutions has in some cases obscured the real problem and resulted in a needless continuation of the occurrence of the injuries. Basically, you know, we think simply in our solutions and because we think simple, our simple solutions do not fit the complex context of the injury of the athlete. No, and we have, we have evidence that, that reality is complex. So you could say, let's do it better. But the fact is that this quote is from 1985 already. So the problem we're facing right now was already established in 1985 and we haven't meant, we haven't been able to, um, to get there. My idea is that we focus so much on context that we also forget about the context. And this may seem a little bit cryptic, um, but look at this. We think context, context, context. We need to listen to the athletes and we build our evidence around the athlete. But there's so much more going on that we do not even consider in our, in our interventions that we can do better there. And this is where I think leadership comes in. Well, leadership is not something that can take over. I think it can be supportive and conditional for successful implementation of our evidence into preventive care or clinical care. Because leadership is creating an inspiring vision of the future. Two bullet points in this ecological model here. Leadership is motivating and inspiring people to engage with that vision. Leadership is managing, de managing delivery of that vision, a process. And it's also coaching and building a team so that it's more effective. Your team is more effective in achieving that vision. So here you can see we focus much more on, on other aspects of this ecological implementation framework that we haven't considered yet in our traditional approaches towards implementation. And this goes for, for injury prevention, but even so in clinical care. When you take care of an athlete, probably you do that in a multidisciplinary team, but even if you do it one-on-one -on -one in the athlete, you are the leader towards the athlete. You need to take the athlete towards a specific end goal of your rehabilitation process. And in doing that, you need to consider that leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. So basically, you need to convince an athlete that what you're proposing is actually what he, what he wants to do himself. Right? We need to communicate better and wrap it better in a, in a nice message. Now, leadership is this, this broad, untangible concept. If you Google leadership, um, in, in, in Google or in Amazon, there's so many types of leadership, the whole street leadership, um, uh, great leadership, quiet leadership, soft leadership, you name it, um, it's there. In the end, I don't think there's one type of leadership that, that you can fit on anyone. Anyone is their own leader, anyone is their own person, and you just need to find and unlock that personality you have in you to bring some of the leadership skills to your clinical or in your preventive practice. I already alluded to that leadership is part of a process. Uh, it, it, it supports a process. And if you think about processes, you also usually think of frameworks and maybe business processes or management processes. This is what we usually think of when we talk about leadership. And one of those management frameworks that describes a process from problem to solution is the STAR model by Jill Gilbraith. And this is the model here. And I think it's better presented as this. In order to get to a solution for a problem, first you need to have a strategy. And based on that strategy, you have a structure. And that structure leads to processes. Those processes can lead to rewards and those rewards need to be achieved by people, the people we want to reach. So this is a whole structural process. 
Now, when we talk about implementation in its current form, we usually only th think about processes, the rewards and the people. So we have this intervention, we talk to our athletes, we talk to our coaches, and we say, okay, what facilitators, what barriers do, we, do you perceive? And then they say, okay, it's difficult to do this, it's easy to do that, and we build our intervention around their, their beliefs and their ideas. So we make processes, and those processes include rewards. Right? We give them the reward for doing something. Um, we tell them, if you do this, then this is the outcome. Because we know the barriers and facilitators, and in the end, people will do it. So this is how we focus now on implementation. But there's an issue with that. You see, we don't focus on strategy and structure here. Um, and this is kind of pinky and the brain. I don't know if you know the cartoon, but these two mice want to take over the world. They have a lot of processes. They come up with a lot of ideas to do so. There are some rewards there, but they never succeed. They never succeed. The problem here is that they don't have a strategy and they don't have a structure around that strategy. They have an end goal. It's something else. They want to take over the world, but they don't have a strategy to do so. And this is also what happens with a lot of our implementation efforts. We know what we want. We want to implement our evidence into practice, but we don't have a strategy around that. How are we going to get there? What structure is needed to get there? Now, the beauty of this STAR model is you can apply it to interventions, but you can also apply it to clinical care. The beauty is that you can measure effects of misalignment. So if there's no strategy or the strategies are unclear or not agreed upon, and there's a lot of business management literature about this, that leads to confusion. You can measure confusion. Well, if there's no structure, if the structure is not aligned to strategy, it leads to friction. Well, people don't want to do what you want to do because there's no structure to do so. You do not build the context around your strategy for that strategy to evolve. Now, if the development of, of those mechanisms is left to chance, if there's no processes in place, it just stops. The system stops, right? They, 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 you have a strategy, you have a structure, but no processes. What to do? The same with rewards. It leads to competition if the metrics and the rewards do not support the goal. And then if people are not enabled and empowered, they will not perform because they don't want to. And then, like I said, there's a lot of literature. And the good thing about that is that we know from the literature cues to look at within this process. So if we if we use a model like this, and, and, and you know there's many of these models out there, the beauty is, is that in the implementation process, you can monitor what's going on. So in this case, if we have a beautiful program, we try to implement it, we have these steps taken, and then we see that it's really difficult in that process to share information and, and leverage best practices. That means that we in the processes are doing something wrong. And then we can specifically see what's going on. Now overlay this, for instance, in a clinical care pathway with an athlete. Well, you need to have a strategy. If there's no strategy, the athlete do not, doesn't know what to do. You need to have a structure. If there's no structure aligned to this, to this strategy, there will be friction with the athlete and so forth. So I think this is a, a, a thinking process that you can employ both from the development of, of implementation efforts towards prevention, but also on a lower scale when you think about athletic care in a clinical, clinical setting. Now, having a management process like I just showed you is nice, right? It, it provides a bit of guidance, but someone needs to supervise that. And usually that is what we call the leader. Um, a, a management process, a management framework is nothing more than a tool that you can use as a leader to go from A to B. Now the question then is what makes a good leader? Um, we don't know. I don't know. Um, and if you ask 10 people, they all say different things. And we have a podcast on that. Um, this is the link to a podcast. It's called Pearls of Performance. And in that podcast... I interview leaders within our field of, of sports medicine um, and sports performance, and I ask them about their leadership styles, skills, lessons learned, and there are some common themes there, 
but you can't really pinpoint what makes a good leader. The only thing I can pinpoint so far, and there's more coming, um, is that a good leader is someone who's honest, someone who is um, clear in what it, what it, uh, in, in communication, has a vision, um, supportive. So there are some key words to say, but how to put that into practice, that is really, really personal. There's a few, few key elements though. Well, what makes a good leader? It's not about you. Lose your ego. No, it's never about you. You need to empower individual roles in the organization to take responsibility. An organization here is broad. So if you're one-on-one -on -one with, a, with, a, with an athlete um, who's under your care, empower that athlete to take his own responsibility. If you are within an implementation process that involves organizations and that involves coaches, empower them to take responsibility for their part within that process. You need to delegate. You can't do it all by yourself. You need to make this organization work for your mission. Right? And if something goes right, you praise the team. If something goes wrong, you take the blame. Easier said than done. I know. Um, but there's also some evidence, some evidence from, from uh, football, for instance, that shows the um, value of leadership when it concerns athlete health and when it concerns athlete care. And uh, I think I've shown this before many places, and this is actually Jan Ekstrand's data. He's shown it to you probably as well. That there is a correlation between a coach's leadership style and the incidence of injuries in player availability. Basically, a bad leader, a bad coach with a bad leadership style has more injuries in his team and less play availability. So this is a direct link of leadership style and coaching styles towards uh, athlete, athlete health. Also, communication is important. This is a follow-up study on that where Jan Ekstans uh, looked at communication styles with medical teams and, um, and, uh, and coaches, for instance. And here you can also see that bad communication um, leads to a higher rate of injuries. So leadership styles by the coach, communication within a high performance team are directly related with injury rates. Now this is, this is um, a, a new paper just came out and, and Jan Ekstrand talked about coaches leadership style and communication within a team, but also athletes themselves have a role here. So we, this paper looked at athlete leadership styles and, and, and the team captains of, of teams. And they found that if the team captain, the leader of the team, the, the athlete leader of the team, has a good leadership quality, own perceived good leadership quality, but also if the other for, fellow athletes perceive that player um, to have good leadership qualities, then... There's a stronger team identification that leads to better performance. There's a positive impact on health, less injuries. And there's also a positive impact, and in this case, actually a negative impact on the risk of burnout. So there's less risk of burnout, less risk of injuries. And that is simply because there is a, a social interaction within a team. And if there's one leader within that team that has certain skills and qualities that uplifts the team, that is beneficial for the health of the other athletes. So a good athlete leader is approved team health. And this is what makes then a good uh, team leader, you would say. Well, this is a really good book by Sam Walker, a captain class, in which he looked at the biggest, the best teams ever existed um, in our current history. And he found that what makes these teams their best teams is that they had great leaders. They had great captains. And he described, based on the qualities of these individuals, what makes a good sports leader. A good sports leader is someone with doggedness, with selflessness, emotional control, principal dissident, uh, has functional leadership, and is really good in practical communication. Basically, this fits all the other qualities I just said. Lose your ego, take the blame, uh, praise the team. It all fits in here. And uh, I, I, I recommend you read this book. It's really, really good. Now, we talked about coaches, we talked about athletes, but then how about the systems? If we talk about injury prevention, how do we deal, deal with that? 
Um, we did a study on that in, in our Olympic athletes, uh, national Olympic athletes. We're doing this now uh, international Olympic uh, committees as well to see if there's geographical differences. But basically what we found is that injury prevention is a learning process. And in that learning process, everybody says, well, it's not just me, it's the entire staff that needs to be engaged in injury prevention. And the entire staff needs to com communicate with the athletes about the symptoms and injury. So it's not just the medical staff, it's also the coaches, you know, it's also the support staff, but it's also the athletes themselves. And that puts you, um, when you're in charge of clinical care of athletes, in the position that you need to take leadership here because everybody looks at you and you're likely the only one who thinks, oh, this is about communication and it's not just about me. But then you need to take others by the hand and lead others towards their responsibilities so they can support you and in the end, the health of the athlete. So there's a lot, a lot of evidence out there that leadership as part of a whole process of injury prevention and as part of a whole process in towards athlete care is an important factor, an important concept that we have not been using a lot yet. We see it a lot nowadays in, in manuscripts the last year or so. So there's a lot coming out, but I don't think we have encapsulated it well enough in our, in our care yet. Now you'll say, does it work? Well, let me go into that. Um, not an example from sports, but an example from a, a different realm where also load, load management is of critical importance where it concerns uh, health. Circus, circus arts, uh, and specifically Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil had the problem of a, a high number of um, injuries, and they wanted to do something about that. And they knocked on our door and they said, can you prevent our injuries? And we were happy. We said, okay, let's do that. We think we can do this in sports. Why can't we do it in circus and performing arts? So we arrived and then we thought, oh, this is a bit more difficult than we thought. The problem here is they have 27 shows all over the world. All shows are different. So it's not just you intervene in football, you intervene in 27 different sports. 1400 artists, over 1400 artists, each with different roles within all these shows. So all with their individual load capacity load. They had more than 70 medical staff and they had more than 7,000 performances each year. So where do we start? On top of that, all these artists, they have different roles, but they also have different backgrounds. Well, 30% were uh, with an athletic background, former gymnasts of the Olympic level, of a more recreational level. But they have a completely different way of dealing with load, load capacity, taking care of themselves than, for instance, someone who's traditionally trained as a circus performer. So that whole road from from childhood to where they are now is completely different and you we all know that that baggage that you bring along is completely completely um, uh, making you the person you are now and on top of that there was a lot of different cultures as well or injury prevention and and care of your own health is completely different from someone with a russian culture than someone with a chinese culture or someone with an american culture for instance so we had this whole potpourri of of individuals with backgrounds, with cultural heritages, um, and, and also with roles within shows. So just one universal prevention program would not work. And I think this is also something we are facing um, with injury prevention in sports. Maybe less so, but there's a touch of it. And I'll show you what circus is about.
So this shows you what Circus is about. Um, this is the cool thing about data science as well. We put um, inertia sensors on athletes and artists for a while and we measured the actual load in, in rotational speed, G's, forces, height of jumps, number of jumps. And we were surprised by how high their load is. And then you need to imagine they do this five days a week, two times a day. So that's incredible. That's staggering. And then we realized, okay, so if they are uh, forced to do these loads, then, then well, there also must be some external factors that give them rest, like any other athlete, there's, there's periodization and all that. So we, we started to look at the system. And now if you put here artist in the middle, then directly around the artist in the dark gray circle, you see those things we can actually measure. Stability alignment, the artistic background, the technique they have, movement quality, fitness, their lifestyle. This is what relates to the artist. Now think about our, our preventive care. Usually we intervene on those things. We intervene on strength and conditioning. We intervene on stability or on, on movement quality. That works because it's closely related to the athlete. But if you look in those circles around the artist and the athlete, then you see that there's also external factors that fo uh, focus on the, the artist or the athlete. There's also external factors that intervene with those factors around the artist. So the further out you go, the further away from the artist or the athlete you get, well, the, more, the more diffuse it becomes, but it doesn't make um, it less less important to intervene in such areas and here you can see in the outside area all the different uh, organizational levels that are part of, of, of a circus uh, company but that affect some of these factors as well so now if we want to intervene we have the medical department on the left it's called PMED they can do a few things but a lot of these factors that we establish actually are under the realm of other people within this, this organization. So now where do we start? So we thought to start with more of a management leadership type of uh, style of process where we'd, we'd like to change the culture. So we would not like to tell the system, you need to do this. We wanted the system to do this. And we took a five-step approach. Um, this is still a work in progress. Um, it was more of an organic approach and we're trying to establish now what we actually did, why we did it, how we did it and why it was so successful in what we did. So it started with an idea, local exploration, then global exploration, and then we still, we still didn't intervene anything yet. Only in phase three we started to realize, plan, manage, strategize and prepare our intervention. And then in phase four we delivered and implemented it. And the beauty about this intervention was, like I said, it's not us telling the system, hey, you need to do these exercises. It's not us saying to the system, hey, this is good for you. Um, it's the other way around. We actually asked the system, there's a problem, do you see it? What can we do to help you solve this issue? And they came with a lot of ideas. And we bundled these ideas into an intervention. So first development and preparation, then implementation. And usually what we do with, with current um, evidence implementation, we forget this development and preparation phase. So we came with a concept that was deemed a durability by design. So it's not that um, our evidence will help you to improve. No, by design means you need to do something yourself to improve. Durability is not something that happens to you. It's something that you create. <coughs> and within that, we have three pillars. We have the preparation pillar. So if you need to do this five days a week, two times a day, you need to be prepared. How do you do that technically? How do you do that psychologically? Now, if you do these exercises uh, five days a week, two times a day, how best can you perform? How can you achieve your maximal performance? And after that, you need to recover. So what can you do to, to remain or get back to your optimal state of well-being? And this is not so much different for sports, if you look at it. There's preparation, there's performance, and there's recovery. Now, in those silos, it's not us who put evidence in there. 
it is the artist and the coaches and the medical staff who put evidence and best practices in there. And it was kind of a menu system where we where we told everybody involved, so not only the artist, but also all the other people involved, please look in there. This is diligent preparation, this is diligent performance, and this is diligent recovery. And we created a intake video for all new artists to explain them about this durability by design culture. And I think it's pretty cool to share this. In an effort to continuously strive for a high performance culture, we wanted to come up with a concept that was built for you, the artist, using a collective approach. After months of discovery with artists, coaches, performance medicine teams, artistic directors, and company managers, we've put the very best ideas into a single initiative. It's called Durability by Design. Your job, your responsibility, is to keep the wow on stage night after night. Our work, our expertise is used to better support you through the path to ensure we put the best performance on stage night after night. Durability doesn't happen by accident, it is by design. Durability is your ability to withstand the physical, technical, mental and emotional demands so that you can perform your best night after night. By design means that you and your team approach your well-being with an intentional, proactive and interdisciplinary approach so that you can repeat your performance with optimal health. Durability by Design is a team approach that combines the best elements of healthcare, performance optimization and enhancement, including workload management, injury risk reduction, and much, much more. We break this down into three key pillars. Prepare. Diligent technical and psychological preparation. We use targeted planning and education to develop physical and emotional qualities that enhance performance and reduce injury risk. Perform, achieving your maximum performance potential. The state of performance excellence is achieved through a combination of preparation and recovery, resulting in a state of accomplishment and personal fulfillment. Recover, an optimal state of well-being. Restore yourself to your best state through appropriate sleep, nutrition management, and healthy lifestyle habits. From artists to coaches, performance medicine to technicians, our mission is to keep the wow in the performances every night for our audiences. Durability by Design is a company-wide initiative that starts with you. It's an artist-centered approach where you work with your team and resources to create your own best individualized plan. Stay healthy. Stay engaged. Durability by design. Now, it's a pretty cool intervention, uh, if I may say so myself. And I do hope you see that some of the key terms and elements that I introduced in this lecture so far come back in this. Um, in this initiative, uh, there was the, the word team, there was the word empowerment, there was you know, many of these, these terminologies that we try to combine in here. And this really spoke to, to artists and staff. Now the question is, did it work? Well, between 2015 and 2019, we started implementing this in, in, in 2015, we had a 15% reduction in all injury rates. So this is all injuries reported. This is reported at the medical medical department. We had a 26% reduction in the number of missed performances. And we had a 27% reduction in the number of acute non-contact and overuse injuries. That led to timeless. That's quite a steep reduction by actually not having a full intervention mandated across uh, a group of individuals but having a supportive intervention that brings evidence in a tangible, understandable way towards a system. So we invoke the cultural change. And as said, we are still trying to figure out what actually happened, what we did right, what we did wrong, and how we can improve that. So stay tuned for that. But I think these numbers speak for itself in terms of the value 
of such a, a broader, holistic, supportive approach, which is, is different from what we're doing right now. So my argument is that we need to take the lead to its healthy performance. You know? Protecting athlete health is pivotal for athletic success. And if, if you look at the literature, implementation to date has not yielded you know, the improvement or the prevention of injuries that we could expect based on what we know from the evidence. And I feel that that comes because we focus on the development of, of interventions based on theory and then we define a plan to bring these interventions to practice. But the process that is required to create a context for successful intervention, we disregard. And we need to bring that in. And leadership and management type of approaches um, are, are a key to understanding that. So we know that leadership is a, a key element of success uh, for business management so why would that be any different for us because we do have evidence and i've shown you that that bad leadership or positive leadership associates with athlete health outcomes right? and leadership if we implement it well and, and employ it well can positively impact changes towards improved athlete health but now you can say nice but how does this apply to my clinical practice now this, this um, editorial came out last week in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. It's about principles to guide care of acute non-traumatic pain in sports. Now, if you look at this quote, kind of the conclusion of this, this, this um, um, editorial, it says, implementing these principles will require a cultural change within sports and sports medicine because there's enormous barriers, right? So basically, this is a conclusion we usually see when we focus on a new intervention, a conclusion we usually see when we say, okay, we have this great thing, but now we need to implement it. That requires a cultural change. That requires a breaking of barriers. So in essence, we conclude every time that we need better leadership to manage change. So I would say you need to own the change yourself. So practice it. And we need to take the lead towards healthy performance. Thank you very much.